Joanne Conroy, MD, is the CEO and president of Dartmouth Health. She was also recently elected by the American Hospital Association to be their chair-elect designee. We've got some of our patients pretty spoiled that it's so integrated. When you need to have a prescription renewal from your doctor's office, you don't even have to do that. We take care of that for you. Our pharmacists call them. And it shows up in your doorstep two days later. You know, that's a pretty high level of service. We discuss top issues for the American Hospital Association, unique challenges faced by rural healthcare, and the lasting impact COVID-19 will have on health system initiatives and management. People were reluctant to change, but once they knew that they had to change, they changed. And the second thing is remote work. Dr. Conroy is an advocate for women in leadership. She provides advice for aspiring women leaders and shares what organizations and male leaders can do to further equality. Basically saying, you know, you're at a point where you have incredible influence. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it to actually make a difference in the world? Let's turn to Dr. Conroy to learn more about her new role and her overarching vision for leadership in healthcare. Well, good afternoon, Joanne, and welcome. Thanks, Gary. It's great to be here. Congratulations on being chair-elect of the American Hospital Association. Very cool. Thank you. It's really an honor to serve an organization that does so much for American healthcare. And uh, through my um, three years that I've been serving thus far, you really appreciate um, the complexity of the issues that they're dealing with and right. um, how effective they are. But what are the several key issues that the American Hospital Association is dealing with now? There are five pillars of their strategic plan, but I would say two of them right now are super important. Number one, ensuring the financial stabilities of hospitals and health systems. I don't think people appreciate that if we get backed up with either a COVID surge or patients that we can't place in post-acute care facilities because of staffing issues, et cetera, if we start backing up, what happens is that people when they present to our institutions cannot be cared for. That's actually what you saw in Rhode Island in the beginning of COVID. Remember their emergency rooms were just overwhelmed. Well, it wasn't because their emergency rooms were overwhelmed. It was that they couldn't move people through their facilities and they were backing yeah. up into their emergency rooms. Imagine if that happened to hospitals across the country, what challenges that would present for their you know, American patients. And then the second thing is workforce because they're interconnected. You know, we have had significant decreases in the number of nurses um, actually practicing in the workforce. And considering that we have an aging population across the U.S., I mean, we need more nurses rather than fewer. Everything we want to do requires people. And there are just not enough people. And I live in a state where the unemployment rate is some is the lowest in the country and um it is um we've just got to be super creative now about how do we create a pipeline for our workforce how do we retain them and then if you can't find people to do those jobs how do you replace those jobs with technology let's move to dartmouth health if we could you've been the president and ceo there for now over five years mm -hmm. Can you describe Dartmouth Health for us, Joanne, please? Sure. We're the most rural academic medical center in the country, and we have the Lebanon campus, which is the well-known Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. We also have three critical access hospitals. We have a um, PBS hospital in Keene, New Hampshire. We have a visiting nurse and hospice association, which is probably is the largest geography in New Hampshire and Vermont. We deliver care to a very rural population. But the real powerhouse of Dartmouth Health are these five gigantic multi-specialty group practices in Nashua, Concord, and Manchester, which is in the southeastern part of New Hampshire, Putnam uh, practice, which is in Bennington, Vermont, the practice in Keene, um, New Hampshire, and also, of course, the large academic practice up here in Lebanon. We have over 2,200 providers in those practices. And 
let's be honest, our providers, both our APRNs, which are not included in the 2200, and our physicians are um, really the reasons why patients are attracted to a health system like ours. It's really knowing that they get world-class care wherever they touch the system. But all of these providers actually are connected and work together. We're a truly integrated system. Everything can be cared for without you ever leaving the borders of Dartmouth Health, number one, and your record, your pharmaceuticals, everything is all integrated into one uh, patient portal. So it makes it incredibly easy for patients to advocate for themselves and get their care. Yeah. Well, that leads to the rebranding that uh, you recently led. Uh, Why did you rebrand to Dartmouth Health and how was that received by the community and your medical staff and and your employees? We had not changed our brand since, I don't know how long, maybe 25 years. And it was funny, like I said, are those like trees or mountains or you forget that when you develop the brand, you know, every symbol has a meaning, but, you know, 25 years later, nobody remembers what you really started out with. Um, But we really needed to reintroduce ourselves to the community, which, because we changed, we've changed since that brand was developed. And um, we actually spent three years doing it. Now, COVID added a couple of years onto it. We could have done it a little bit faster um, if there wasn't a pandemic going on, but it was really um, deliberate to figure out who we were, which was really fascinating. They spent a lot of time talking to a lot of stakeholder groups and um, decide, decided that the term, you know, we are, we are really embedded in the community. We're not an academic medical center without any connections to the community. And we're actually Mm -hmm. woven into the fabric of our community. So we talk about world-class care, just where you need it most, which is in your community. And we are really embedded in our communities. That's the beauty of rural healthcare. You know, you can solve world problems in aisle three of the local grocery store. And everybody knows everybody, you know, people will stop me and ask me questions, not just about their care, but about where the health system is going, et cetera. Um, You know, you don't have the anonymity that you maybe have in more urban settings. Um, So I think that's a beauty of delivering care in rural America. Dartmouth Health is the most rural of the medical centers. What specific issues for those that may not be aware what specific issues uh, does Dartmouth Health need to address because it's in a rural area? People who live in rural communities actually have poor health outcomes. Believe it or not, they have less access to care, but a lot of that is because of transportation. We don't have great transportation networks in rural America. Um, the distances that they have to travel, uh, sometimes the geographies that they have to travel through, I would say at the same time, you know, the issues around broadband and internet and all the things you want to deploy in order to deliver care in people's homes become a big struggle. Um, Especially our home health teams often have to drive down a gravel road, you know, for four to six miles and they come upon a dwelling that they're trying to care for somebody in that dwelling who may have iffy uh, electricity and uh, no internet, and um, very little in terms of public services out in these incorporated rural areas of our community. It just creates those challenges to deliver care. I've actually gone out with our home health care people to go to some of their new patient evaluations and check up on existing patients. And it's a little bit of a journey. Like I, they gave me a pair of yak tracks. So It was in the winter. So, you know, we were climbing over hills of snow and ice in order to get to these homes. And, um, you know, you have to have a pretty good sense of direction because, you know, not all the roads are really well labeled. But, you know, the people were so grateful and thankful for that type of care. You know, we would love to do a hospital at home, but hospital home is going to be really different in rural America than it is in like Boston. And um, we've just, We'll figure it out. 
Now, I have to say, we have an incredibly robust telehealth program. Um, even though we do a lot to patients, it's actually provider to provider. So we are helping rural hospitals stay afloat by providing them with tele-ED, tele-psych, tele-ICU, tele-specialty care. So those patients that can be cared for in the, those communities can stay there. And that has continued to grow. I you know, had a recent report. I think we've added another 25 programs over the last um, six months across wow. New Hampshire, Maine, and um, Vermont, and even a little bit into Massachusetts. So um, the services we provide are really important for rural hospitals to actually stay afloat. And hospitals that we don't own that are yep. just members of our mm-hmm. kind of community network. The pandemic obviously took a toll on on health systems. What have you found that um, by way of new initiatives that you're taking because of uh, COVID? So there are two great things about COVID. Number one, we realized that we could do telehealth. As I've said before, you know, one small strand of RNA has actually done more for the telehealth industry than billions of dollars of venture capital until we had to do it. You know, there were, there was a lot of just, I don't know if it was just people were reluctant to change, but once they knew that they had to change, they changed. And the second thing is remote work. We are full in on remote work. We look through all of our job descriptions and here at the academic medical center, over a third of the people that work on this campus are working remotely, permanently remotely. That means we employ people in over 35 states across the country. And what it does for us, though, is allow us to recruit nationally. So we can recruit you from, you know, any state in the country and you can work from your home. That is gives us a huge kind of recruiting advantage Mm -hmm. versus having people have to come here to the Upper Valley because, you know, spouses have other jobs that may not be as movable. And it really allows right. us to access all that talent. And for two years running, we have determined that those people that are working remotely are our most engaged employees. They have just enough autonomy. They have enough responsibility and connection that they feel part of the team. But there is something about their ability to do their job in their own home that they appreciate. And it comes out on your engagement surveys. Mm -hmm. Joanne, as you know, well, some health systems are trying to work out arrangements with the health insurers to see if they can get into the financing stream a bit. Is that something that uh, is part of Dartmouth Dartmouth Health strategy? Yeah, we would love to do more of that. But frankly, a lot of the insurers are not interested. And our market's too small, Gary. It's just... You know, we have 1.6 million people in New Hampshire and probably, you know, seven, 800,000 people in Vermont. It's just not a big enough market for them to think about doing something here in New Hampshire or Vermont. And that's kind of the, the reluctance we run into. But have you been able to pursue uh, consolidation, Joanne? So we spent three and a half years trying to bring... Uh, Granite One into our network. Um, it was very disappointing that we weren't able to get it over the finish line. And, um, you know, some of the expectations from the attorney general just were undoable. They wouldn't have made us successful. And it was very disappointing because both organizations had spent a lot of time focusing on that. And, you know, I called the attorney general and, you know, still thanked him for all the effort. I said it was, we we're all disappointed that we couldn't make it happen. Um, And, you know, you still have to work with people. And so um, there, we tried to really focus on not assigning blame, just, just, you know, appreciating that we weren't going to be able to move forward. Having said that, however, we work with the University of Vermont and Maine Health very closely. We meet three times a year, our executive teams meet, we try to figure out the things we can do together. And you know, in the height of COVID, we worked with the University of Vermont to bring in a plane full of PPE from China. And Mm. um, 
you know, there are so many things that we can still do together. We are constantly looking at opportunities. And I think as it gets harder and harder to, you know, make your margin in, in the market where your, you know, costs are going up and your revenues not covering that, you know, we will find other opportunities to work together across larger regions. How concerned are you with these large well finance companies, CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, now Amazon, Optum, elbowing their way into ambulatory care and primary care? How, how big a problem do you see that becoming over time? Yeah, we've talked about it a lot. Um, you know what? People need access to primary care. And if they can improve that access to primary care, that's good for our patients. It's good for everybody. I think our patients, when they get fragmented care from Amazon here, um, you know, one medical there, if it's not all coordinated, they're going to get a little bit frustrated. We've got some of our patients pretty spoiled that it's so integrated. You know, when you need to have a prescription renewal from your doctor's office, you don't even have to do that. We take care of that for you. Our pharmacists call them. And it shows up in your doorstep two days later. You know, that's a pretty high level of service. Yeah, you're really making a point that you have the opportunity to build on integrated care and do even more, I'm sure, than you're doing uh, as opposed to uh, the one-off, more fragmented care. And that may be the answer to the question of how you compete with those uh, big, well-financed companies. Well, let's turn to women's leadership. You've been... Uh, active in that for a number of years. You co-founded Women of Impact. Um, why did you do that, Joanne? And how has that uh, worked out over the, I think, last 10 years or so? I've been pretty focused on at least gender equity around compensation and around access to opportunities that create leadership. So Women of Impact. I went to a leadership development session. And I was like, Ugh, I don't really know if I want to go. And I went, and I'm so glad I did. It was, um, I was the only woman in healthcare there. There were women from Microsoft, Dutch Oil, Shell. And, you know, it was fascinating. They led us through this process, not giving us skills or just doing networking, but Basically saying, you know, you're at a point where you have incredible influence. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it to actually make a difference in the world? That's a very different construct than most leadership development programs. Like it throws it right back on you. And after I went through that, I said, you, you know, there's a lot broken in healthcare that needs to be fixed and I can't do it alone. And so I said, well, I'm going to grab a group of women and we're going to figure out what we can do about it. And uh, I wrote a grant to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and they gave me like $95,000, and I convened the first group um, called Women of Impact. And I think we're up to eight cohorts now. It's invitation only. We don't necessarily want to be really big, but we want to, number one, identify our own personal impacts. And everybody has this kind of personal goal when they when they finish a two-day session and everybody goes through a two-day session when they come into the organization. But we also want to do things together. So we've helped establish the Carol Emmett Foundation, um, which actually has a leadership development program for women. Um, we help sponsor the Equity Collaborative, which is where HR and leaders from across the country look at our hiring practices. And we send our data to McKinsey that actually compares it with organizations that are not involved in the collaborative. And does the collaborative actually make organizations move faster along that equity timeline? And um, it's just, you know, frankly, it's so energizing to be around women that are actually committed to a lot of the same things. And out of it, we yeah. have got Karen Feinstein talking about creating a national patient safety board, kind of like mm -hmm. the... NTSB. Um, you have um, people that are actually championing um, diversity and equity causes within their own organizations and then taking them nationally. And a number of our members actually are serving in the current administration. I mean, it's, it's great. 
they are actually getting to the point where they are decision makers nationally. And it's just kind of creating that pipeline. So number one, these women know each other. And number two, they figure out how can we leverage each other's strengths. And Hmm. they've done that very effectively. Well done on that. We've made pretty good progress in medical school admissions. Uh, I think it's 50% women, 50% men. But as you mentioned earlier, uh, if you look at, for example, chief medical officers in the largest health systems, it's not good. It's substantially less than 20%. If you look at CEOs, your peers, uh, the last numbers I saw were around 20%. What can we do to try to move this along, Joanne? Yeah, there are a couple things. Number one, um, you know, it's going to take us 100 years if we go at the at the pace we're moving right now. So we need to kind of accelerate it. I think people understand that they've got to invest in creating a pipeline for women leaders. People are very focused on having diverse pools with any leadership position. And it's not about merit. There are lots of people out there that are incredibly talented, but you have to work harder to find them and get them in your pools. I would say um, it's also um, creating opportunities and also the awareness um, of a lot of young leaders about the kind of risks and responsibilities of moving into leadership roles. And I tell every woman that asks about leadership trajectory, I say there are two things. I said, you need to have an appetite for personal and professional risk because you will be in a position where they may say, thank you for your service. Here's your severance. And it feels crappy, but that comes with the job when, especially in healthcare, when, you know, reorganizing a health system or a regional unit is not uncommon. I would Mm -hmm. say that second thing is that they have to be willing to move. And unfortunately, when you get two professional families, that becomes a little bit more difficult. And that's where the conversation begins within their family unit about kind of whose career comes first at what time. And I know a number of couples that figure out how to balance that. It's hard, but I mean, that's one of the important transparent conversations that professional couples have to have early on. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. You're talking about men personally in terms of the family being supportive uh, of a woman having to, you know, pay the price, so to speak, of becoming a leader, whether it's moving or more time on the job or whatever. Uh, but in terms of the workplace, the professional workplace, you talked about sponsoring, men can sponsor. It seems to me there's also a recruiting aspect of that where men can actually approach women and recruit them into leadership positions um, and then support the development. Are, are there other, other obvious things that men could be doing to be supportive here? I would say part of it is really developing the right leadership programs to identify people internally and externally, and also creating the opportunities for them to demonstrate their leadership in your organization. It doesn't matter how much training you give somebody, they've got to be able to apply it. So you need to be intentional about that within your institution. I get it that we have an affinity for people that are like us, but I know that my best leadership teams are teams that have all different backgrounds. You know, actually I'm in a minority, like I'm an extrovert and most of my team is an introvert. They process very differently. And I mean, if I had a team just filled with people like me, I'm sure we would make a lot of really bad decisions. So, (laughs) so, you know, diverse teams actually make better decisions. We know that we've known that for 15 years. And um, this is kind of a pathway to creating those kind of diverse teams that can really steer a um, health system as an organization. Joanne, this has been a terrific interview. We really appreciate your time. I'd like to ask one last question if I could, and you've actually addressed this a bit, but let me ask it directly, which is what advice would you have for young women who are kind of thinking about leadership, not sure whether they want to actually go in that direction? What kind of advice do you have for them? They need to do things with and for a purpose. They need to think about the roles and responsibilities that they take on and what impact do they want to have 
in that role in the organization. Be purposeful about it. Achieve your goal. And when you do, don't be shy about telling people about it. And um, make sure that there's there is nothing wrong about tooting your own horn when you've done a good job. In fact, my first husband used to tell me, don't break your arm patting yourself on the back. But I learned to do that very, very quickly because, um, you know, sometimes people are not running around patting you on the back. You have to do a good job because you know that you want to do that job. You do it well, and then you congratulate yourself for doing it. And um, you can tell everybody you want to, but just you, you, actually have to be centered around the, the reasons why you're doing it and um, don't look to other people for approval or accolades. You should be able to give it to yourself. Well, I'm going to give you a great big pat on the back, Joanne. You're just terrific and you have been throughout your career. Uh, congratulations again on your post at the American Hospital Association and please call on us if we can be at all helpful during your time there. Thank you again for being with us. Well, thank you, Gary. It's always a pleasure.